Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of Clarence Carter, Director of the Office of Family Assistance, and the entire OFA team, we'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar. Opioid use disorder in the United States has skyrocketed since 2010, yet little contemporary research has been conducted on the effects of this surge on the TANF population. Existing research about the opioid crisis primarily focuses on its effects in the general population, while TANF-centered studies almost exclusively examine general substance use. Moreover, opioid and substance use disorders have been shown to be significant barriers to employment for low-income individuals. Such an information gap makes it difficult to properly address TANF recipients' needs for effective opioid use treatment. This webinar will explore how opioid use disorder affects the TANF recipient population and also TANF eligible individuals, as well as emerging strategies for assessing and treating these populations. Through this webinar, we will examine the prevalence of opioid use disorder among TANF recipients and the TANF eligible population, as well as barriers to employment it creates. We'll learn two, two promising programs connecting TANF eligible individuals to opioid use disorder screening, assessment, and treatment services. We'll reflect on how state, local, and community-based opioid use disorder treatment organizations can address TANF recipients' distinct needs and we will hear from the Kentucky Targeted Assessment Program, which is a collaborative, comprehensive assessment of multiple barriers to self-sufficiency for Kentucky residents receiving or eligible for TANF. We will also hear from the CHARM Collect Collaborative, a group of 10 Vermont medical and social service agencies providing comprehensive care coordination for opioid-addicted pregnant women, their families, and their children. We want to first bring up our first poll and get some information from you. To what extent is opioid use disorder a problem among clients in your program? I'll give you some about 30 seconds to vote. Again, to what extent is opioid use disorder a problem among your clients in your program? Looks like there's quite a bit of unsure. It's also a large problem, pretty much a problem, but no, none at all. We'll keep collecting those. Um, but first, what we want to hear from Justin Germain, who is a researcher at MEF Associates. At MEF, he is involved with large-scale random assignment evaluations of employment and training programs, as well as research on technology's role in workforce development. Justin received his Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of California at Berkeley. As the author of Opioid Use Disorder, Treatment, and Barriers to Employment Among TANF Recipients, a paper that we at OFA hope to have published in the next couple of weeks, Jermaine will present an overview of current research on the opioid epidemic's effects on TANF recipients and TANF-eligible individuals. He will highlight how opioid use disorder creates barriers to employment, as well as some promising strategies aimed at assessing and treating affected populations. Justin? Thanks, Damon. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's webinar. My name is Justin Germain, and I'm a researcher at MEF Associates. We're a social policy research firm specializing in rigorous research to shape the design and implementation of social programs. I've been working with OFA to identify the state of current research on the prevalence of opioid use disorder and treatment services among TANF participants and the TANF eligible population. There's a lot of research about the opioid crisis swirling around these days, so I've designed my presentation to curate what would be most helpful to TANF agencies and administrators for your programs. Now as a quick roadmap of what I'll be speaking about today, I'll first provide an overview of the prevalence of opioid use disorder within the general population before identifying what we know about its prevalence within TANF and other low-income families. Then I'll share some of opioid use disorder's effects on employment, specifically for low-income individuals. Finally, I'll tell you about treatment and prevention strategies that appear promising for this population, followed by some of the common challenges that can prevent these strategies from being effective. Now, as a disclaimer, while there are many ways of referring to opioid use disorder, for this presentation I'll be using the acronym OUD. 
And before diving into the specifics, I think it's important that we quickly look at how prevalent opioid use disorder is across the United States. OUD is a problematic pattern of opioid use, which includes heroin, fentanyl, and certain prescription painkillers that lead to clinically significant impairment or distress. As of 2015, 2 million Americans had a substance use disorder involving prescription opioids, and over 590,000 experienced a heroin use disorder. As shown on the slide in front of you, deaths caused by opioids have more than quadrupled since 2000 and continue to increase at an alarming rate. According to the CDC, opioids contributed to over 42,000 American overdose deaths in 2016 alone. However, a study released just last month claims that opioid-involved drug deaths are actually 20 to 35 percent higher due to different state standards of reporting causes of death. Now, as shown on the map in front of you, rural areas experience 45 percent more drug-related deaths per capita than urban centers and also have higher rates of opioid overdoses. Almost twice as many men experienced opioid overdose deaths as women in 2015. However, heroin and prescription OUD rates have increased much faster for women in the last 15 years. This is increasingly important when we look at opioids' effects on TANF families, since over 85% of adult TANF participants are women. Now, OUD influences individuals and communities differently than other forms of substance use disorders. The fact that opioids are primarily taken for pain reduction is key to understanding how opioids connect to unemployment. 40% of non-working men aged 25 to 54 claim that pain prevents them from securing a job. Furthermore, Regions with greater opioid medication rates have also experienced declines in their labor force participation. Now, unlike the general population, limited research is available about the prevalence of OUD within the TANF and TANF-eligible populations. Much existing data is at least 10 years old and prior to the current opioid crisis. We do know that individuals in poverty are more likely to be dependent on opioids than those with incomes over 200% of the federal poverty line. Yet, research examining the TANF population tends to emphasize findings about general substance use disorders that aren't specific to any single substance. One study estimated that the 1996 introduction of TANF correlated to a 10 to 21% reduction in illicit drug use by women at risk of welfare. TANF's drug sanctions, work incentives, and a strong economy likely contributed to this result. Currently, approximately 5% of TANF clients are estimated to be addicted to any illicit substance, and 10% have used an illicit drug in the past month. Long-term public assistance participants are more likely to experience a substance use disorder than short-term participants. And although more relevant information is needed, research into Medicaid can help draw limited parallels to the TANF system due to the program's overlapping membership base. About 636,000 Medicaid enrollees had an opioid use disorder in 2013 and subsequent Medicaid expansion has likely increased this number. Physicians prescribe painkillers to Medicaid enrollees twice as often as they do for other patients, increasing their exposure to opioids in the process. And now it's important when we go over these studies to remember that these studies are not arguing for a causal link between public assistance receipt and substance use disorders. They're simply detailing the correlation between the two. Furthermore, these prevalence rates must be taken with a grain of salt. Many researchers believe that precise rates are difficult to obtain because people with substance use disorders may hide their use. Individuals across all income levels do this, while individuals on public assistance may misreport due to the stigma attached to substance use disorders and fears that they'll lose their benefits if they reveal their addiction. As of 2005, over 75% of state welfare offices still relied on participants' self-disclosure of substance use disorder concerns instead of more comprehensive screening tools. Concerns over drug testing exacerbate the fear of disclosure. 
15 states had versions of mandatory drug testing for public assistance participants as of March 2017. Depending on the state, positive drug tests can lead to mandatory treatment, reduction in assistance, or even a temporary denial of assistance. Therefore, the frequency of substance use disorders among the TANF population may be higher than reported, which underscores the need for more research, screening options, and policies that reduce incentives to hide abuse. Now, OUD also creates obstacles to the attainment and maintenance of secure, gainful employment. Opioid use has a direct relationship to higher workers' compensation claims, costlier medical expenses, and fewer days worked. 42% of individuals with an opioid use disorder have worked for more than one employer in the past year, which is twice the national average. Moreover, a Brookings study suggests that the increase in opioid prescriptions over the last two decades could account for nearly 20% of the decline in American males' labor force participation rate and 25% of American women's. Yet it's important to remember that OUD falls within a web of coexisting problems that worsen low-income individuals' difficulties in securing employment. Many studies conducted on this issue have focused on low-income women. A 2003 study found that female TANF participants who participated in CASA Works for Families, a program created to provide collaborative case management services to low-income people with substance use disorders, displayed an average of six different potential barriers to employment. Some of these barriers included limited work experience, domestic violence, low levels of education, and mental health disorders. Now currently, a 1% increase in county unemployment rates correlates to a 3.6% increase in opioid-related death rates. Yet there's mixed evidence whether employment alone can decrease substance use disorders. For example, the National Center for Children in Poverty recommends using both treatment services and employment to address substance use disorders. Multiple studies have also indicated that employment before or during substance use disorder treatment can increase retention and success. Therefore, substance use disorder treatment methods that consider such coexisting problems may help decrease barriers to both employment and abstinence. Now, TANF participants and other low-income individuals with substance use disorders typically utilize treatment options designed to serve the general population. These are a selection of strategies that appear promising for OUD, but which are not representative of all approaches currently being used. For those with an opioid use disorder, medical treatments, typically administered through methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone, often provide the best chance at recovery. Medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, combines counseling with medication designed to normalize body functions and relieve opioid withdrawal symptoms. It's been clinically proven to reduce the need for inpatient detoxification and increase patients' ability to gain employment, yet it isn't used as widely as experts recommend. This may stem from misconceptions about drug substitutions, inadequate physician training, or the need for daily clinical visits for patients using methadone. These barriers make it difficult for TANF participants to meet work requirements if their treatment is not an allowable activity under their state's TANF program. The 21st Century Cures Act and 29 states' expansions of MAT funding have aimed to improve these accessibility problems. Now, strategies aiming to curb improper prescribing practices have also become widespread. As of March 2017, all states except Missouri kept track of controlled substance prescriptions. Some states require practitioners to check their state database before prescribing opioids to patients, while others have enacted opioid prescribing limits. A few states have also passed pill mail laws that heavily regulate providers who prescribe opioids improperly or for non-medical purposes. The CDC has also collaborated with the American Pain Society to create recommendations for providers about proper prescribing habits. Contingency management, which provides prizes to people with an opioid use disorder when they attend counseling sessions, pass a drug test, or perform other activities promoting abstinence, is effective at increasing time spent in treatment. While this can be expensive in resource-limited communities, 
lower cost versions have also improved treatment attendance and completion. Finally, community prevention coalitions initiate collaboration between multiple stakeholders dedicated to decreasing OUD and overdose rates in their community. Some common members of these groups include hospitals, medical societies, law enforcement agencies, NGOs, and addiction treatment centers. Community prevention coalitions focus more on public engagement and treatment collaboration than other strategies. Now, while there are a few OUD treatment and prevention strategies specifically targeted to the TANF population, we may be able to identify relevant strategies by examining practices used to address general substance use disorders that are tailored to TANF and other related populations. Screening and assessment procedures, for instance, help identify individuals who need assistance to address their substance addiction. As mentioned earlier, low-income populations, especially those on TANF, are often hesitant to report drug use due to legal or public assistance concerns. While generic screening methods, like caseworkers relying on people to fill out self-disclosure forms, have limited effectiveness, specialized screening raises the chance that a TANF participant will disclose their substance use. In this method, higher risk populations receive more screening and trained caseworkers conduct one-on-one -on -one interviews. While this is generally used to supplement generic screening, it's been shown to increase substance use disorder referral of New Jersey public assistance participants from 4.4 to 10.3%. Now Ms. Ramlow will show how the University of Kentucky has expanded off this method through the program she oversees. Intensive case management, which involves long-term personal monitoring and social service assistance, has been shown in a random assignment study to improve TANF participants' employment, substance abstinence, and treatment attendance outcomes. By meeting with participants multiple times a month and covering their childcare, transportation, and housing needs before treatment, caseworkers successfully reduced substance use disorder rates for women on TANF. After 15 months of treatment, 43% of intensive case management participants were abstinent compared to 26% of a control group receiving basic screening and referral services. The individualized placement and support model of supported employment has also proven effective in randomized control trials to improve employment outcomes. Successful programs have assisted individuals with substance use disorder and vocational services and have encouraged employment that promotes recovery. While it's most commonly been evaluated among individuals with mental health concerns, a 2017 randomized control trial showed this was a promising strategy to help secure employment for people with opioid use disorders as well. After one year, 50% of individualized placement and support participants with OUD secured competitive employment compared to 22% of a control group. Finally, Family-centered treatment shows promise at addressing substance use disorders among women with dependent children. Women make up over 85% of TANF participants, and 70% of women entering substance use disorder and 70% of women entering substance use disorder treatment programs have children, making them a crucial demographic to study. Family-centered treatment includes parenting education, employment readiness, behavioral therapies and close collaboration with the child welfare, criminal justice, and social service systems. Our panelists from CHARM will show that there's promising evidence to support such a treatment method. Now, child welfare families are another relevant group to study in this scenario. By working with courts involved with these families, family treatment drug courts promote treatment through incentives and intensive judicial supervision. A 2008 study found that these specialized courts have led to longer treatment participation. Non-court-based treatment programs working alongside the child welfare system have shown mixed engagement and accessibility results. An Illinois study examined programs with a recovery coach who conducted repeated outreach, facilitated access to services, and ensured that patients were engaged in treatment. Researchers suggested that completion rates for this program could have been improved through services targeting coexisting problems, treatment tailored to people's drug of choice, and additional employment assistance. Now, TANF service providers and public assistance policymakers 
face many challenges when working to stem the opioid crisis for the TANF and TANF-eligible populations, and these are some of the most salient. There is limited information about opioid treatment strategies targeted at employment and work readiness for TANF participants. Since there's a scarcity of research about the effects of the opioid crisis on the TANF population, it's difficult to determine ways to reduce employment barriers. Secondly, coexisting barriers may hinder the accessibility of effective treatment services, especially medication-assisted treatment. Methadone-based medication-assisted treatment requires a patient to visit a clinic daily. A 2004 study of these programs discovered that bureaucracy, work schedules, mental health issues, family situations, discrimination, and other factors all hindered patients' access to treatment. This is especially relevant for TANF families, since low-income individuals are more likely to receive methadone for treatment instead of buprenorphine, which does not require daily clinic visits. Also, limited collaboration across social service systems can hinder screening and treatment. Public assistance agencies, treatment providers, and courts often collaborate with each other to serve individuals with OUD, yet they may not be doing so enough. Without sufficient collaboration, it is difficult to identify and monitor individuals requiring treatment. OUD also harms individuals throughout the entire workforce system. In addition to hindering unemployed individuals' entry into the workforce, OUD decreases work productivity and job tenure. To improve TANF employment outcomes, it's important to promote OUD services for incumbent workers as well. Finally, individuals at risk of losing public assistance or custody of their children simply fear disclosing their opioid use disorder. To understand the actual prevalence of OUD among these groups, comprehensive screening measures and policies reducing incentives to hide abuse are needed. So overall, in terms of key takeaways, there are two. There's limited research about the opioid crisis among TANF participants, and we simply don't know enough. Furthermore, OUD is one of many coexisting problems that worsen difficulties in securing employment. Finally, in terms of future research, there's a need for more research on the prevalence of OUD among the TANF and TANF eligible populations. And as mentioned previously, certain treatment strategies have been shown to be effective and simply could be evaluated for TANF. The opioid crisis is an incredibly critical situation, and we need to know more about how it affects the TANF population in order to be effective at fighting it. If you'd like to reach out to me about this research or want to know where certain statistics come from, the paper that Damon mentioned will be out within a few weeks that I authored. Furthermore, my contact information is on the screen. Thank you so much, and I really look forward to your questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, Justin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen Broyles, and I'm with the Peer Technical Assistance Team. And I just wanted to mention a few housekeeping tips through the webinar. Um, first of all, the webinar is being recorded, so you are on mute. However, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat box or place questions in the question box. At the end of all of the presentations, there will be a Q&A, so please submit any of those questions and we'll make sure that the appropriate presenter gets the information. Also, during the webinar, if you need any technical assistance with the webinar platform, please raise your hand. It's at the top of the screen um, in, a, in the bar where you'll see a picture of an individual with a hand raised. Click on that and we'll reach out to you or just contact myself, Stephen Worlds, or Deidre Young, and we will follow up with you. Also, there will be an evaluation at the end, and we just make sure that you please stick around and get the information. And also, as, as many of you noted, there will be a recording and a transcript of this webinar that will be posted on the PHT website in a few weeks. So thank you, and I'm going to turn this back over to David. Thank you, Stephen. And before we get into our next presentation, time for another poll. So everyone, how do you screen and assess your clients for substance use disorders? How do you screen and assess your clients for substance use disorders? Give that a couple seconds. Okay. 
Okay, and you can keep voting on that while we move into our next presentation. Our, first, our next presenter, Barbara Romolo, is the director and co-founder of the University of Kentucky Targeted Assessment Program, a former clinician working in inpatient, outpatient, and other community nonprofit settings. She has been with the University of Kentucky Center on Drug and Alcohol Research since 1994, serving as the assistant director of the Institute on Women and Substance Abuse from 1994 to 2003, and director from 2003 to 2006. She began to provide consultation to the Kentucky Cabinet for Health and Family Services during the advent of welfare reform in the mid-1990s and has partnered with CHFS and other statewide agencies on multiple initiatives to improve Kentucky's capacity to identify and address barriers to employment, self-sufficiency, family safety, and family stability. The targeted assessment program identifies and addresses barriers prevalent among low-income parents, including substance abuse, substance use, mental health problems, intimate partner violence, learning deficits and disabilities, and basic needs, as well as participant strengths and, engage, and engages participants in action plans to support progress. This presentation will highlight the key components of TAP's approach in the context of the opioid crisis. Case examples will illustrate engagement strategies, pretreatment, effective referral, and support for ongoing recovery, individual, and systems level interventions. Barbara? Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here today representing the Kentucky's Targeted Assessment Program. As noted, uh, our program, which we call TAP, was um, developed and implemented through a partnership with the Kentucky Cabinet for Health and Family Services, the Department of Community-Based Services, and the University of Kentucky Center on Drug and Alcohol Research, which is a part of the College of Medicine. It is supported 100% with TANF funds, and we are assisting parents involved in P Kentucky's public assistance and child welfare systems. The purpose of TAP is to identify and address barriers to self-sufficiency, family stability, and safety, including, as noted, substance use, mental health, intimate partner violence, learning problems, that would be deficits and disabilities, and basic needs. Before I, I talk more about the program and the research, I'd like to tell a story. We, participants come to us through many, many doors, and one of the strengths of the program is that that is possible. Um, I wanted to tell you about uh, an individual who is already involved with a Kentucky Works program, which is our, our TANF program, at the time that we met her, and I'm going to call her Sandy. She was a 26-year-old woman with two children. She was referred to TAP by her Kentucky Works program case manager when staff at her community service placement expressed concerns because she seemed to be sedated. In addition, her attendance was inconsistent and she complained about transportation problems. The staff were both annoyed with and worried about her. The TAP assessor got the referral from the case manager and then arranged to meet with Sandy, um, whom she met at her home, and Sandy agreed to participate in the program. TAP's assessment revealed that she had a substance use disorder that was being treated with Suboxone by a physician with brief monthly check-ins but no additional treatment services. Sandy had a history of failed treatment attempts but found medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, through recommendation of a relative. Sandy described a history of childhood abuse and intimate partner violence and was experiencing verbal ab abuse and controlling isolating behaviors in her current relationship with the father of her youngest child. She and her children were dependent on him for transportation, child care, and other supports. She had an aunt and uncle nearby who could play a more supportive role in her life but were kept at a distance by the boyfriend. Sandy reported she had liked school before she dropped out when she got pregnant in high school. She reported current mental health symptoms that were indicative of depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. The assessor developed a plan with Sandy and, with release, communicated with the Kentucky Works case manager. TAP helped Sandy transfer to a different MAT provider where her Suboxone dosing was corrected 
and also helped her engage in outpatient evaluation and counseling for co-occurring disorders, trauma, and in intimate partner violence. The assessor drove her to her first appointment and at Sandy's request sat in on the first session. Once Sandy stabilized, TAP provided education about MAT to the case manager and the community service placement supervisor, and Sandy was allowed to return to her placement. The assessor met with Sandy regularly, followed up with her treatment providers, and communicated regularly with the TANF case manager about her progress. When Sandy was able to identify her current relationship was abusive and decided to leave, TAP helped her to find housing through collaboration with Kentucky's Domestic Violence Program that has a HUD grant for victims. TAP also helped Sandy obtain child care and helped her with job applications. Her aunt and uncle gave her an old car that wasn't working, and the Kentucky Works Program helped with car repairs. TAP also helped her with applications to the local community college, and she was accepted into Kentucky's Ready to Work Program that supports TANF recipients attending college. Through Ready to Work, Sandy was able to obtain a work-study job, and this eventually led to regular employment. She chose to continue her education as well. She began to talk to her treatment providers about whether and when she could begin tapering off Suboxone. So back to the barriers and, and how TAP came to be. Um, it, this is all based in the early work we were doing um, throughout the country, research into women and substance use, because there was a dearth of research available until it be that began to grow in the 80s and 90s. And, and we learned a lot that helped us know how we could do better. So estimates of drug and alcohol use disorders are almost double for individuals who receive TANF. Women who are receiving TANF and have substance use disorders report re co-occurring depression, anxiety, and high levels of PTSD. Studies have shown intimate partner violence to be higher among women receiving TANF than other low-income women not receiving TANF. Mental health problems have also been found to be more prevalent in the population, as have adverse childhood experiences and adult trauma. In terms of learning problems, studies in Three states indicated that between 20 to 50 percent of women have some type of learning pro problem, and 20 to 25 percent have IQs of less than 80. In addition, unmet basic needs have been strongly correlated with mental health and intimate partner violence. And finally, the presence of multiple barriers continues to be the strongest predictor of non-participation in work activities and continues to be linked to poor employment among low-income parents. I wanted to share with you some data from our program. This is fiscal year 2017 when we assessed about 2,200 um, participants, both male and female, but mostly female. Um, and you can see that the, the highest prevalence of and the four targeted barriers um, is mental health, 59% for substance use and then lesser degrees of intimate partner violence and learning problems. Now, individuals might be experiencing these barriers in combination, which isn't shown in this particular chart. What we find is that 63% of, of the participants in fiscal year 2017 experienced two or more of these barriers, and some as many as all four. In terms of unmet basic needs for that same group, we see our, our common top two are housing and transportation. In recent years, social support has come up to be almost um, equal with those as, as a barrier self-reported by participants. And you can see parenting, physical health, uh, legal health, and children's needs follow. With regard to opioid use, I wanted to share a study that looked at 2012 to 2016, and uh, this is lifetime self-reported data for more than 12,000 TAP participants during that period. And you can see that 
we, opiates are, are pretty steady up there at the top, the green, uh, the green line, as is uh, OxyContin and methadone. Those are pretty st steady. And, and Kentucky has long had an opiate problem. It is not new with this particular crisis that we're experiencing now. What you can also see then is the um, increasing prevalence of IV drug use and heroin use along with buprenorphine, which is, uh, could be used either in, in, as a tre treatment or off the, on the street. So our program exists in 35 Kentucky counties. We hire and place now 58 target assessment specialists at our community-based services offices. So that's Kentucky Social Service System. And we are there to receive referrals from both child welfare and public assistance uh, referral sources. The fact that we are co-located with the uh, DCBS staff is, is a, a critical and key component of our program. These our uh, PEP staff are University of Kentucky employees. They get their salaries and benefits uh, through the university, and their, their travel is paid through the university. But their computers and their phones and um, their work site is full time with uh, their coworkers, the community-based services workers. So that eases referrals, that eases communication and collaboration about cases and has made all the difference in terms of, I believe, increasing the number of individuals that we're able to serve. We hire folks who are skilled clinicians. They are trained in, in, in all of the barriers that, we've, that I've discussed previously. And their job, um, in addition to uh, well, first of all, their job is to develop good relationships with their, their colleagues and with all participants and with all community partners. When they meet a, a participant or a potential participant to offer services, and if the individual agrees to work with TAP, they conduct a really holistic assessment across barriers and strengths. Um, they're, they're not doing one screening. They're not looking just for substance use disorders. And um, they are looking across all of the barriers. What we believe is that these um, moms and dads are, are people with lives who live in a context um, and live within their families and their communities, and that there's a l always a lot going on um, with individuals living in poverty that make life difficult and may ease their, their success or hinder their success. And the more that we can learn about them, the better. The more that they feel heard and understood, the better. So that is part of the process of, of conducting a holistic assessment, is developing a really good rapport, trust, and um, mutual trust and understanding. And they know that they have somebody on their team who's going to help them and that, that we can offer them help um, in a wide range of ways. We provide strengths-based case management. That's one of our, our um, evidence-based practices. We provide pre-treatment um, and case ma intensive case management and create a customized service plan with the participant. So we're going to be identifying what they see as their most critical needs and um, help figure out where they are in their understanding of their problems and what their readiness is to change. So if they do have a substance use problem, where are they in the stages of change? We use motivational interviewing and other evidence-based practice to help determine where they are and what are the next best steps to take. Many referrals have been made at the point that a problem is identified that a participant doesn't follow through on. So we use motivational interviewing and pretreatment to really work to prepare people to engage in treatment and make good use of that referral. That can be working on internal barriers, their understanding of their addiction, for example, their understanding of their 
the effect of trauma on their life and um, their understanding of the resources that are available, their, their ability to feel hope about their situation, their sense of who is, who is their support system. All of those things are used to help put together a good plan um, for each individual, and that is a very individualized plan. And they have uh, the ability to say no. They have the ability to say, I don't want to do that, but I will do this. For example, they might need a, uh, a, a more intensive inpatient substance abuse treatment service, but if they're not willing to do that, what are they willing to do? And we're going to work with them on that and, and come up with a plan and then try it and see and continually um, meet with them and talk with them about how things are going with their plan so that they can make move forward. We're also going to be working in that, in that um, as we develop the plan on any external barriers, because with low-income populations, those are often, and then certainly in our, our state, are often the things that they get in the way if they don't have transportation, which is incredibly common in Kentucky, which is mostly rural. How are they going to get there? How are they going to keep going to appointments um, if they don't have child care for their kids? What are, the, what are the things that need to be put in place? And sometimes before we ever get to that, we're working on getting the utilities turned back on because they don't have heat. We're working on finding them a, a decent housing because they don't have that. We work with many individuals who are homeless or uh, sleeping in, on, on couches and having their kids in, in other people's homes but don't have a stable place to live. So working with uh, participants on housing barriers is, is often very important and um, useful, as well as finding ways to um, ensure that they're going to have transportation. I think some of the things that are different, as I said, we get referrals through the child welfare system and through the uh, TANF, the public assistance program here in Kentucky. And the needs of the workers and the case plans are different in those systems. And so we're going to be always collaborating with the referring worker um, to make sure that we're helping the participant make progress on the plan that is set forth with them, that they're able to meet the requirements as best they can. And sometimes we're able to help shape the, the nature of those requirements, which sometimes are quite unreasonable and not in keeping with, with what services are available in a community, for example. A service might be uh, ordered for somebody. They're required to do something that simply is not available, and we're going to be able to advocate with that, that referring caseworker about that that uh, requirement and get it changed, perhaps, to something that is doable. We're going to constantly follow up with our participants, with a referral source, and with a community partner. So in many cases, the community partner is a, a re referral for agency for mental health problems, for uh, partner violence for substance use, and we're going to be with a release, we can communicate back and forth. So if our participant stops showing up at treatment, we're going to be in good communication with that provider. They're going to get in touch with us. We're going to be able to get in touch with the participant and figure out what happened. Was it a relapse? Was it their transportation fell through? Did they have a crisis? Often yes. And it's our job to help do that crisis intervention, that problem solving with that person, and help figure out, OK, how do, what do we need to do to get back on track? In the TANF program, we're working also with job readiness programs, community services sites, employers. We get referrals quite often, um, as is was in the example of, of Sandy. We get referrals more often than from the case managers. We get them from the adult education programs from the community service placements where they are seeing people on a daily basis or a few times during the week, and they're really much more likely to notice when something isn't right, something's not going right for somebody. 
and they know uh, they know TAP, they know exactly who to call, and they know that we're going to do something to help. And so that those collaborations are very, very important. It's very important that we communicate effectively with uh, both the Child Welfare Agency and with our case manager. In Kentucky, we have an online information system that has made this quite easy, and we are required and enabled to communicate in writing on, through the online system. So we can communicate in real time to the case manager when there are significant developments, um, successes, progress, uh, when things don't work out well and we're needing to step back and reevaluate the plan. So that communication has been really, really valuable and for both TAP and for the case managers. We also provide consultation and training about these multiple barriers whenever, whenever we're asked to do that and whenever, whenever it seems appropriate. Sometimes that's in a formal way where we're, we're training case managers about medication-assisted treatment. But much more often, it occurs when we are talking about a case, which we do a lot. We talk um, in people's offices. We communicate on email. And there's a lot of case collaboration and talking about what's going on and what, what needs to happen next. And through those interactions, we can really help the, those workers um, gain an understanding, both of the individual that we're serving and their particular unique needs and circumstances, but also the nature of addiction, um, the nature of intimate partner violence, the, uh, the likelihood of relapse, the likelihood that a woman might return to her perpetrator, and talk about the cycles and, and, the, and, and keep instilling in the TANF agency, the Child at Welfare agency, that even though these events occur, there is always hope, there is still hope, and that this is part of the process of people making their way forward. So I think that that's a very valuable. We're right there on site, and we can do lots of both informal and in, um, informal and formal training, and case consultation whenever we're asked. We also provide a lot of information. We do an extensive report, um, our assessment findings and recommendations with our plan, which we update. We do written monthly updates and status reports on all of the participants that we're serving. We also have a role in advocacy, I would say, over the years since we've been doing this for a while. I should say that we've been doing this now for 18 years, so have gone through many, many phases of, of uh, development in our own program, but also changes within these social service systems, in our economy, in the nature of uh, the substances that are being uh, used at the time. The recommendations for treatment have changed vastly during those years. And when we, when we uh, first started, MAT was really hardly available. There were a few methadone clinics in this state, but nothing else. And now we have Suboxone readily available, and not necessarily well-regulated treatment, um, and a lot of, of misunderstanding of MAT, a lot of experience of poor quality MAT, and uh, part of our job is to educate and advocate for participants, and that includes identifying those treatment programs that are of not good quality and steering our participants into those programs that are good. For example, with MAT, it is best practice that in addition to receiving the medication, the person is involved in, in treatment, in counseling. And if they're not, that's not good treatment. So in the, as in the example of, of Sandy, we're going to make sure that 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 gets um, that that happens, and that everybody understands why that needs to happen. So we can really support good practice. We can talk to treatment providers about a rule that they might have that is really prohibitive. For example, up until just somewhat recently, a lot of our treatment providers did not allow people into a treatment program if they were also uh, they were receiving MAT. And that was a huge barrier and made no sense. And actually, most of our providers now, I think, um, have changed that practice and have welcomed MAT, folks on MAT, to participate in treatment as well. TAP exists in uh, several different communities. There's 35 different counties in our state. We have regional. Um, 
administrations for community-based services, and we have a central office in at, in the state, in our state camp, capital of Frank Frankfurt. And TAP is, from the very beginning, engaged in multi-agency collaboration and has found that that has also been essential to the success of our program. So that we work with the administrators at the state level, at the regional level, and then in our local offices to make sure that we're implementing the program according to our protocols, according to best practice, that we're um, figuring out how to set up referral mechanisms in a way that works for the DCBS and works for TAP, that we are uh, keeping everyone aware of the resources that are available particip for participants. We have multidisciplinary advisory councils in our sites. They help with the hiring of staff. They help with implementation through quarterly meetings and um, examining our data. And we share data back and forth and have lots of conversations about both what's working but also what's not working. And I think that that's been a key um, strength of our program as well is that we have always been willing to um, acknowledge when something wasn't working and look at what our part might be in that and look at uh, solutions with our community partners. And that has served us well over the years as we have continued to improve the program and learn as we go. wanted to share a little bit of uh, our outcomes. And these are very specific to the Kentucky Works program and those of you who are in your TANF programs, those of us who are having to deal with allowable and countable activities. TAP is an allowable component, not countable, um, which has been a deterrent to referral, but, uh, but we uh, persevere nonetheless. And one of our responsibilities is to ensure that when we get a referral that if they're not already in accountable work activity that we're going to get them into accountable activity as soon as possible. And uh, another thing is that if we are, if someone is looking like they're going to drop out and fail and they're accountable that we're going to help see what, how, what, what can we do to shore them up so that they can maintain in their accountable activity. So, of the terminating assessed TAP participants in the Kentucky Works Program, 65% of them part were participating in an accountable work activity within six months of TAP assessment, and the average amount of time to enrollment in that work activity was seven weeks. TAP has conducted several outcome studies. I wanted to share um, one from that was published in 2012. It was a six month from six month from baseline to six month follow up study uh, with for 322 participants. And in general, we we saw statistically significant decreases during that time frame in mental health symptoms, substance use, partner violence, the percentage of our participants that had an open child welfare case, participants of part the percentage of participants experiencing work difficulty, and the, a decrease in reliance on TANF and while employment increased. Uh, we are, don't have perfect outcomes, and we certainly have individuals with whom we are not able to help, but a, a, a good many we are, and we think it's uh, due to this really unique um, approach that we take, which is very, very personal um, with really skilled, compassionate individuals who can operate in a really non-traditional way. They, they're at the DCBS office, but they are able to go, go to people's homes. They're able to meet them in other safe locations like libraries or McDonald's, able to work with them on safety planning, able to uh, drive them to an appointment if their uh, transportation falls through at the last minute able to help them with all sorts of the critical basic needs and help them address their multiple um, difficulties if they have, have problems in the areas of substance use, mental health, and partner violence most, most prominently, as well as with learning disabilities and deficits. I will say that our data, we've been collecting data now for 18 years, a lot more data than we share in our reports to the state. And I think one, one common thing that we note uh, in our TAP participants, be they male or female, is the prevalence of childhood trauma in, in almost all of them. 
um, very, very difficult experiences. They were not all raised in poverty. Some were, but but most of them have had really difficult, um, adverse childhood experiences, um, other kinds of trauma, sexual abuse, and uh, and many and almost most of the women um, have experienced some kind of partner violence and in their teenage years and in their adult relationships and um, they are well well all well deserving of our support and of trauma-informed approach which we didn't really even know about trauma-informed care when we started this program uh, we were getting there in terms of the, the research and the findings that we were seeing but that hadn't put all, been put all together at the beginning of TAP but we have learned along with our uh, the researchers and service providers about the need for trauma-informed care, sensitivity and caring, and um, uh, empowering individuals to make decisions and choices for their own lives. We're very uh, grateful that we've been able to contribute positively. I have um, included, I'm not going to go over these slides, I'm going to, you'll be able to find, see the, the PowerPoint, the follow-up study is included. That's just will give you a sense. That's the state of Kentucky, and those are the sites where TAP is currently re, uh, located uh, across the state. And that represents very rural communities, Appalachian communities, and urban communities. I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to speaking with you um, if you have questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Barbara. Uh, we did get a couple of questions, and we'll put those in the Q&A uh, queue for the end of the webinar. Um, now we want to bring up another poll. Do you believe your community has the adequate resources and services available to assist low-income individuals with opioid use disorder? Do you believe your community has the appropriate resources to assist low-income individuals with disorders? related to opioids. Like B is the clear winner. Now we'll move on to our final presentation, um, beginning with Sally Borden, is the Executive Director of Kids Safe Collaborative, a community-based nonprofit organization in Burlington, Vermont. Ms. Borden started with Kids Safe in 1998, and that role she leads numerous community initiatives to improve the safety, health, and well-being of children, including the Children and Recovering Mothers Charm Team, a multidisciplinary group which coordinates services for pregnant and postpartum women with a history of opioid use disorder in their infants. Infants. Dr. Johnston was a founding member of the Ch of Charm Children and Recovering Mothers team of team approach to working with pregnant women with a history of opioid dependence and their infants. She leads the University of Vermont Child Health Improvement Program or VCHIP quality improvement project on improving care for opioid exposed infants or ICON. She'll be presenting with Dr. Ann M. Johnston who was also a founding member of CHARM and was working on the team approach to working with pregnant women with a history of opioid dependence in their infants. She too leads the University of Vermont Child Health Improvement Program, VCHIP, Quality Improvement Project for Improving Care of Opioid Exposed Infants. Dr. Johnston, Dr. Johnson developed an interest in the follow-up care of infants discharged from the NICU and in 2000 started a neonatal medical follow-up program at the University of Vermont Children's Hospital, then the Fletcher Allen Health Care Center. At that time, she also developed an interest in opioid-dependent infant infants. With her team, she created a novel way of, we of weaning infants off opioids by weaning by weaning doses of methadone in the outpatient setting while in the care of their family. To date, Dr. Johnston and her team have followed over 1,200 infants exposed to opioids during pregnancy. Through getting to know these women and their families and hearing their struggles and remarkable strength in overcoming their obstacles, their journey into a life of recovery has become a passion of Dr. Johnston's. She's also an incredible team. She also has an incredible team that works with her and shares her passion for the care of these patients. Anne and Sally. 
Yes, um, this is Ann Johnston, and um, thank you for the introduction, and I'm going to get right into it. Um, and uh, Sally and I have done this presentation a number of times, and if I uh, go quickly through something, she will actually uh, remember and talk about it. Um, so um, what we're going to be talking about, the two of us, is opioid dependence in pregnancy. And this is very briefly, um, opioid exposed newborns and some of my reflections about that. And um, then the CHARM Collaborative. Um, and I just wanted to start um, this with um, uh, putting out some context here. Um, people tend to focus on neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, and of course I feel that neonatal abstinence syndrome is just um, an expected uh, event that happens when um, uh, the newborn is prenatally exposed to opioids, and that the much bigger issue, and um, what all of you are focused on, is, are the families and the family health. Um, and um, and, and I appreciate that from the previous two talks. Um, and this is uh, um, an article put out um, by the CDC um, reviewing neonatal, neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS incidence rates uh, in 25 states, of which Vermont was one, um, and Maine and West Virginia were um, uh, the highest um, in um, uh, in terms of the uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome rates. And, um, and also, Vermont had the highest annual rate increase of states surveyed. Um, and um, when we look at that, I had a reaction. Um, and my reaction was not necessarily that the um, opioid uh, uh, problem was particularly bad in Vermont, although we have certainly seen it. Um, and, um, and really, what the what we have to think about is what's making this um, uh, increased diagnosis and increased rate. And what we know is that this probably represents increased access to safe treatment, both prior to pregnancy and during pregnancy. And that certainly happened in our state. And Sally will be talking more about that. And that we have had this increased focus over the last 18 years since I started working with these families um, in terms of um, identifying um, uh, those families and babies at risk. And lastly, this is a good thing. Now, I do review a few myths, and perhaps these are well recognized as myths to all of you, but um, they may not be. Um, and so the first myth is that opioids during pregnancy, so prenatal exposure of the fetus to opioids, will result in a damaged baby. Um, and um, I still find that a lot of people um, uh, have that opinion. And so that there, what's clear is that there's no evidence that opioid exposure in and of itself results in developmental delay or any other lasting effects on the exposed child. Um, on the other hand, alcohol exposure, uh, as well as tobacco exposure, nicotine exposure, can result in um, physical, developmental, and behavioral effects. Um, the next myth is that every baby born to a mother on opioids is born addicted. And uh, this may be a little bit semantic, but I refer to opioid-exposed babies as those who were exposed prenatally to um, prescribed or illicit opioids, um, prescribed meaning methadone or buprenorphine, usually. Um, Opioid-dependent infants and newborns are those that exhibit signs of withdrawal severe enough to need medication. And there is no such thing as opioid-addicted babies. Um, infants cannot be addicts. The disease of addiction requires obsession, compulsion, loss of control, breaking the rules. And in our data from Vermont, um, we really have found that only 20% of opioid-exposed infants um, require pharmacologic treatment. Um, it used to be higher, but that has been the case for the last number of years. 
um, for, with a lot of reasons for that. And primarily in other, um, the, the national data shows more like 50 to 60 percent. Myth number three, if a baby needs treatment for opioid withdrawal, it must be because the mother used opioids during pregnancy. Um, and that's, and when I say used, I say in quotation marks, obviously supplementally used. Um, and, um, and that is uh, clearly not true. The severity of withdrawal is not associated with the dose of medication or whether a mother used or not during pregnancy. However, exposure to nicotine and tobacco can increase the severity of withdrawal. Uh, and certainly higher scores um, of, of abstinence um, or withdrawal in a baby do not indicate that a mother has used during pregnancy. And myth number four, um, opioid abuse and pregnancy uh, leads to child abuse and neglect. Um, and we have had a fairly broad experience over a number of years. Um, we have um, over 1,500 babies born to opioid-dependent women um, through our clinic. Um, over 80% of these babies were discharged in the care of their mother or father. Um, or both, and the majority of parents we see are actively engaged in treatment and display good parenting, although they may need quite a lot of support, as we've heard, um, in order to do so and have many needs and challenges. If a parent is not adhering to treatment, does not want to receive treatment, and is actively using, they may not be ready to parent a child, and that's certainly um, something we've seen also. And why is medication-assisted treatment for pregnant women with opioid use disorder the standard of care? Um, it has remarkable health benefits both for the mother and the baby, including decreasing the rate of prematurity, small, uh, decreasing the rate of small babies, improves the health of the pregnancy, lowers infant mortality. Um, and it's important to recognize the pregnant woman does not feel high, usually, but feels well and has no cravings if, if she's on. Um, the appropriate dose um, of MAT. Um, successful engagement and treatment increases the probability of good parenting, and we generally um, uh, recommend that detoxification not occur during pregnancy. It's rarely successful and can be dangerous to the fetus. And lastly, my, one of my concerns, um, big concerns, one of our concerns is that Anything we do as a society that drives pregnant or as uh, health care providers or care providers, anything that de drives pregnant opioid-dependent women from seeking treatment results in more prematurity, higher infant mortality, and less probability of successful parenting. So we have to be very, very careful about that. Um, what happens when an untreated woman with opioid use disorder who delivers a newborn um, who's um, probably hiding her opioid use disorder? Um, we have higher incidence of neonatal complications, including opioid withdrawal, perhaps. Um, if it's recognized that the mother is opioid dependent at, uh, del um, in the birthing um, hospital, um, there's often Child Protective Services involvement, and there's the challenge of taking care of newborn and starting treatment for addiction, which might result in uh, temporary placement for the child. And if this is unrecognized and the infant exhibits no withdrawal in the early period, after discharge the infant may be particularly irritable, and that family's ability to cope is impeded by the fear of discovery. Um, mother will probably remain active in her addiction, continuously flying under the radar, may expose her baby to unsafe situations, and is often unwilling to come forward for fear of losing her child or children. Um, and as we know, the medication part of medication-assisted treatment, um, generally in pregnancy, we use methadone or buprenorphine um, with advantages um, um, specific to patient populations to both. We have a very high uh, rate of buprenorphine maintenance here in Vermont because we were sort of late coming to the game with methadone um, uh, maintenance. And, um, and we have a rural population um, and did extensive training on buprenorphine. 
uh, with our physicians. And just to clarify and, and look at some of the issues that face substance using pregnant women and their children, there's often um, generational substance use, untreated mental health problems, limited parenting skills and resources, unstable housing, unstable transportation, some legal involvement, and then um, hugely exposure to childhood trauma, as we've heard about from Barbara. And underneath it all is this great degree of shame, um, which prevents um, women from being able to be open and share the truth and keeps them um, in uh, um, their fear and fear of discovery. What we try to do in our um, program um, and also at CHARM um, is build trust, focus on respect and strength, decrease fear and shame, and promote breastfeeding. And um, at our hospital, as, as was said, we do actually treat babies with methadone, um, but only 20% of the exposed babies are treated. They are discharged on home on methadone, so not in hospital for very long. And then we have a, uh, an infrastructure, including a neomed clinic, where they come uh, within a week and every two weeks um, for weaning of the methadone um, and um, monitoring of growth and development. Tiny amounts of methadone. They are tiny amounts of methadone. Mm -hmm. Sally is re reminding me, so not enough to um, uh, be abused, but that was one of the main concerns 18 years ago when we started this was um, how was this going to be safe. Um, and so if we look at um, up till the end of 2016, um, how many um, women we or babies we followed born to moms on methadone or buprenorphine at delivery, um, you can see that in the red um, it is predominantly buprenorphine with some on methadone. And then just looking at outcomes, um, for us, based on 277 babies, and we have more at this point, um, um, their cognitive language and motor outcomes at 7 to 14 months of age are actually excellent. This is percentiles that you're looking at. And in fact, it looked at one point like they did better um, than the average baby. Um, and uh, that's sort of evening out now. And then there, there, there's certainly no developmental issues at this early age. Um, they are, of course, at, at risk um, due to their family environments, um, uh, to having some learning problems, school problems, um, and um, certainly at risk for addiction, the disease uh, of addiction or alcoholism, just based on um, the, the genetic potential. Um, but um, this is a good start. I think my key points that I wanted you to get from this um, uh, is that the incidence of neonatal abstinence syndrome is increasing, but we have to really look at whether this represents increased identification cases, increased access to care for pregnant opioid-dependent women, or what does it represent. Um, behind every case of neonatal abstinence syndrome, um, it is important to recognize there is a mother and perhaps a family suffering from the disease of addiction, and this is where efforts need to be the greatest. We need to decrease our judgment, increase access to trauma-informed treatment. Developmental and behavioral outcomes are overall not affected by opioid exposure in utero on its own, unlike alcohol exposure. And community strategies that focus on punishment will result in increased morbidity and mortality for children and their families. And um, lastly, um, healthy collaboration between partners, such as in CHARM, has been essential to supporting these families. And I'm going to turn this over to Sally at this point. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Hi, this is Sally Borden. And I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about our CHARM team, which, as you heard in the introduction, is a, a multidisciplinary team focusing on health and safe outcomes for babies born to women with a history of opioid use disorder. And we were cited by, as a model collaborative approach by SAMHSA. Um, and there will be more information um, sent out to you with a link to that if you want more information about the program. 
Um, we see, you know, a lot of challenges that were mentioned earlier for TANF recipients, and um, often that is around meeting their work requirements as well as housing and child care. Um, if they need to go into treatment, um, what are the requirements for that treatment program, and does that interfere with their other um, work or work search re requirements? So those are all very relevant, um, as was described earlier. And um, we see this also as a promising prevention model because um, it's so important for all of the service providers to work together and for TANF providers to understand that the standard of care for treatment for pregnant women um, does involve being on medication-assisted treatment and also to be cognizant of the myths that Dr. Johnson um, explained. So just a quick view of our beginnings. Really, this is just so that you can see that this, our collaborative did not happen overnight. It took many years of hard work to develop the kind of framework for sharing information and working together that we have in place now. Um, and we started way back when um, a few doctors said, wait a minute, let's Let's work together to figure out how to best treat and support these women and make sure they have healthy babies. So that has evolved as we have gone along over these years. There are a number of partner organizations involved, UVM Medical Center and UVM Children's Hospital, and UVM is University of Vermont, um, are the key sort of um, foundation of this collaborative approach. And then um, child welfare is also a very important partner, and a number of different state and community-based organizations come together. Um, one of the things that's really been significant is our public health uh, department has developed a very um, robust infrastructure for uh, providing medication-assisted treatment, and that has really improved access uh, throughout our state. They call it the hub and spoke system, and the hubs are um, the more intensive uh, treatment locations, um, and the spokes, as they were, um, are uh, often community-based providers providing buprenorphine and integrated with other health care and wellness and, and uh, treatment services. Um, just over the last few years, we have significantly increased the number of people on treatment and decreased our wait time, which has been tremendously important for this population. For our CHARM Collaborative, there are a few key pieces that, um, that we find are essential to making this work, this team approach work. First of all, coming to a shared philosophy, and this didn't happen overnight, I must say. Um, it took lots and lots of discussions even to reach that point. But really coming to an agreement that um, while many of us on that team, our primary focus for support is making sure that infants are safe and healthy, that in order for that to happen, improving the care and supports for moms is the most important factor, and I would say families overall, but our focus on the team is really the, the pregnant and postpartum moms. And um, so sharing information is key to child safety and to healthy outcomes. We have our, a memorandum of understanding that we've developed as a framework for sharing information and coordinating services. And we also have a Vermont law that allows for some information sharing as a uh, impanel child protection team. We have about 11 agencies and departments that come together. We meet monthly and we focus on some of the system issues and case reviews. And we focus on what are the most important things that we need to know because there are so many patients to review. Like, well, who are the who are the pregnant women who are doing the next month? Who are the babies that have just been born? And who are those that we are most concerned about? And we look at, we start with the prenatal care. Um, and that care involves, you know, confirming the pregnancy, initiating treatment, uh, medication-assisted treatment, and other treatment services, the uh, um, intensive prenatal care for high-risk women. Um, there may be a residential program option um, that's available in our community where women can go when they're pregnant or with their babies. We also look at the case management and referrals, and as others um, have described in more, uh, more in-depth than we have time here, but really taking a strength-based focus um, and family-centered focus 
to address some of the barriers, such as housing and transportation. We've recently been able to access some private foundation funding to provide gift cards and bus passes and gas station um, gift cards and so on to support um, these women in um, accessing the services that they need. And then, of course, there's the postpartum and neonatal medical follow-up that Dr. Johnson described. We know that we need to start prenatal care early in pregnancy. That is really the key um, element, the, probably the single key most important element for patient success. Um, making sure that pregnant women receive pharmacological uh, treatment, whether that's methadone or buprenorphine, and then that starts as early in pregnancy impossible, as possible. Engaging in substance abuse counseling, and depending on what the level of treatment is needed, that can vary. Um, coming to their appointments and making sure that they are receiving the kinds of supports and services that they need. Our numbers are pretty small. We're a small state, um, but it does give you a sense of those that we review um, and coordinate services for each year. Our child protection system, our child welfare system, has taken um, a very innovative approach, and that's been a key factor in our, in our collaborative. Um, and they have started a practice that is pretty unique nationally, and that is using the differential response system to begin an assessment approximately a month before the due date. Um, and that is not identifying um, the, the um, fetus as a child, but rather looking at the safety of the home environment that that child will be born into. And so allowing for a planning process, again, as an assessment, not a child abuse investigation, but um, looking at what kinds of services and supports a family might need in order to be able to safely care for that infant when it's born. Probably the key outcome there is avoiding unnecessary placement crises at birth we're able to plan much more effectively if a child's going to need to come into custody to know that ahead of time. So what we've found through this process is more, more pregnant women are in treatment earlier with better prenatal care. We have fewer premature, birth, uh, fewer premature births and fewer small birth weight infants. Um, and we look at pregnancy as a real opportunity. Um, women are often motivated to engage in treatment, whereas they wouldn't be otherwise. Better care for infants, supports for moms, shorter hospital stay, and we are really working now to implement uh, the plans of safe care that were required by recent um, federal changes to federal law. With child safety, we've made, I think, a very, some very significant inroads being able to assess safety um, and support services, providing support services, um, initiating both of those things prior to birth. So we have seen a reduction in the number of emergency custody orders at the time of birth and decisions being able to be made with input from all of the project partners um, has been very important. For process outcomes, our team participants uh, really value the time saved, the amount of information that can be shared when we're all sitting in the same room and talking with each other um, is incredible. Um, and we've all learned from each other. Those myths and misconceptions that you heard from Dr. Johnson are all things that many of us came to this team with many years ago. And we've all learned from each other. And we are so confident that we're able to provide the quality of services that we do because of the understanding that we have um, from each other. There's still many challenges to collaboration and especially challenges to serving this population with the very complicated lives that they have. Somebody needs to go to an IOP, how are they going to maintain their work uh, or, or their work search when they're in treatment for six hours a day? Or if they need to go to residential care, how are they going to get child care for their other children? So those are the kinds of issues that continue to um, and will, will continue to be a challenge in working with this population. But by working together, that's our best chance for addressing the issues. Where we're headed and really um, long overdue is having a much stronger peer support component to the work that we do. 
like all of us, the women that we're working with, are most likely to listen to others who have been through the same thing. And so we are um, connecting with a new program in our recovery center. We're also being, we're also working on expanding the kinds of um, supports that we can offer through addressing the needs of, of these women in having, you know, diapers and, and gift cards and gas cards. And listening to you all this afternoon gave me some ideas about partnering better with our um, reach up or TANF providers around doing this in a more um, collaborative way. So that is really, in a quick nutshell, what the CHARM team does. And again, having that um, framework that the health of the baby depends on the mother's health and the family's health. And you can get some more information when this is sent out from um, the publication in SAMHSA as well as some other resources listed here. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Drs. Johnson and Bordem. Uh, we have time for just one question. But the rest of the questions we will share with our presenters. And once we make the presentation available through the PRTA website, we will have the responses to those questions. So stay tuned for that posting in the next couple of weeks. But one question for both presenters, or all three presenters, four, have, have there been any training programs, certifications, or promising practices that you can share with the presenters, share with the people on the webinar, develop for welfare or TANF, or workforce development staff in order to improve their ability to work with opioid-involved clients. So have you come across any training programs or certifications or pr promising practices that TANF programs, workforce development programs, and staff can use to work with TANF involved, to work with opioid-involved clients? So this is Sally Borden. I'll jump right in. Um, children and Family Futures. Um, based in California um, is a wonderful resource, a national resource that provides a lot of information about um, working with this population in particular. And they also operate the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare. So it's not specific to TANF recipients, but, um, but they uh, really provide a, a wealth of information. Um, Children and Family Futures, you can Google them and find their website, which can link you to a lot of um, trainings. And they do provide national trainings um, on this topic, as well as family treatment courts and other, um, you know, other related resources. This is Justin Germain. The one program that I'm familiar with is the LifeLink program in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, it's a social services 501c3 nonprofit that runs the SBIRT program, which stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. I know they work with a lot of other community organizations in order to offer services that um, provide trauma-informed care. While I'm unfamiliar with any specific trauma-informed care programs or certifications, um, the concept of trauma-informed care has started to grow in terms of social service, welfare, and workforce providers that might be worth looking into. And we'll definitely follow up with the presenters on those promising practices and those different um, activities out there and post them with the materials that are going to go up with the webinar. There's one final poll before we close out, but, but while you're answering that poll, I did want to say thank you again to our presenters and also to um, everyone who participated in today's webinar. Once the webinar closes out, there will be an additional feedback. We do take very seriously all the feedback we receive from our webinar participants because it helps inform future webinars and other technical assistance. So audience poll number four. To help us plan future webinars that address your interests and needs, please tell us what topics you would like to see on future webinars.
So we'll keep collecting those ideas for future webinar and technical assistance topics. And again, we will collect all the questions that were submitted through the, the chat feature. We'll submit them to the presenters, and we'll uh, request that they, once they get a chance to complete those, uh, we'll post them with the webinar. So on behalf of the Office of Family Assistance, thank you all for logging in today, and have a good day.